We are so happy. This is uh, Energy 808, the cutting edge, on a given Monday at noon, uh, one of our important energy shows. And Jennifer Potter, who is one of the PUC commissioners, joins us here in the studio. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Jay. It's so great to be here. Thanks for having me back. I was afraid that maybe I burned my bridge no, 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 last no, no, time. No, never, 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 never. No matter what. And, and Marco, Marco joins us by phone from uh, Hilo, from ProVision Solar. Hi, Marco. Say hi. Say hi, Marco. And I uh, can't tell you that, uh, you know, Mondays can kind of be a challenging day after, after a weekend uh, of relaxation, but... To be with two of my favorite energy friends on this Monday just brightens my day and lifts my chakra, chakra level to, to unknown heights. So thank you so much. Yeah, I see it the same way. It's kind of a continuation of the weekend. Absolutely. It makes, <laughs> makes it ease right in. We're, we're doing a good job, guys. Thank you so much for so that. So since, um, you know, Jenny is here and she's a public official and everything, we thought we'd sort of turn the show <laughs> over to her. And the first thing you should do, Jenny Potter, is to introduce your guests today. Yes. Okay. Excellent. See what you can do about that. Absolutely. I think that you, this might be tricky because you're seated on my right side. I'm not sure. I think the camera might have you on my left, but to my right is Mr. Jay Fidel, who is an energy expert extraordinaire. Most of the time he's asking me questions and I think he should be answering them. He's definitely done a lot for our community in terms of encouraging people and, and educating people to get more involved in, in topics around energy and very much an expert and grateful to be seated next to him. And on the phone, we have Marco Mangelsdorf, who's actually a member of my tribe, we've agreed. Um, <laughs> we've become um, fast friends and not only in the energy space where he, he provides great guidance in terms of uh, a lot of things that have happened throughout history in Hawaii. Not that long of a history, Marco, <laughs> but actually a recent history. And then also just as a friend who's, um, who's come into my life at a time where I needed him. Um, very, very, very much, and um, he's been a very strong proponent of, of encouraging me and to pursue my dreams here as commissioner, and I'm very grateful for that. So thank you to you both. Oh, and by the way, he, he is owner of ProVision Solar. <laughs> very important <laughs> to encourage that. So. Yeah. Okay, Marco, you want to do rebuttal? <laughs> uh, no rebuttal needed. No rebuttal, other than I no feel rebuttal deeply, there. deeply t touched, touched, and uh, and grateful for your incredibly kind uh, and uh, and uh, affectionate words. So thank you, Jenny, yeah, very much. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks thank you. from me too, Jenny. Yes, my pleasure. Thank so you. So, what would you like to have us discuss today? Well, we've we've had an interesting beginning of the year. I think. Um, you know, that the PUC has uh, accomplished quite a bit as an organization. I think in the first three months, we've put out more critical orders than, you know, than, than we had in the previous year. We'd handled a lot of rate cases, but we handled a lot of the, the purchase power agreements for renewable energy, which is going to significantly increase um, our, our, our needs to get to the 100% renewable portfolio yeah, goal, yeah. which is great. Um, and we've also worked on the grid modernization. We've been working diligently on um, performance-based regulation. But at the same time, we've been working down these alleys and down this path. There's been a parallel path at the legislature that's taken on some of the, the issues um, in, in terms of how we can get to 100% renewable, how we're going to do that with you know, whether we're looking at incentives, whether we're looking at appliance standards or codes. Um, and, and then we have, you know, uh, the Kahiko companies that are also heavily involved in trying to meet these goals and in their initiatives. Um, we have local and county governments that get involved. Um, for example, MECO recently and, and, and MEDB we were just talking about uh, really was a champion for electric vehicles. Um, and trying to get the, the current infrastructure that we have for electric vehicle chargers, that public infrastructure, in place and viable and continuing on took a very active role there. So, so there's all these players that are playing in this space, and you know, but they're not necessarily all playing together. We we might be in the same sandbox, but but my question, I think, I I pose to to both of you is who who is the leader? Who should be the leader? Who is currently the leader in in this space and and really getting us over the next. 10 years, 15 years, maybe even to 2045. 
Who, who should be taking the, you know, the, the, the bull by the horns and getting us across some of these more intermediate steps and then finally to the, to the long haul? And might that, that role change? Might it be a different entity? Mm. So, Jay, you want to tackle that first? Yeah. And this may be the longest um, <laughs> talk show we have ever had. <laughs> this this talk question. show may go to 2045. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's clear, um, and, and that's not a good thing, because there should be somebody we can all expect will, you know, say, follow me boys mm -hmm. and girls. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, it's hard to answer the question. The fact that you pose the question, we all pose the question, um, means it's not settled, and um, it should be settled. I'm not, in, I'm not even sure who can settle the question. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a great point. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the big players are the legislature, but the legislature is into resolutions this year. They've done a, four or five resolutions, uh, and I'm not sure resolutions actually take you very far. Mm -hmm. um, they need to do, you know, affirmative bills is what they need. Mm -hmm. Bills maybe that haven't been passed over three years or four years of trying. Uh, That's right. I don't fully understand that. Maybe Marco does. Um, I think the office of uh, the energy office is in is in fragmentation right now. It's not clear where they're going, what they're doing, their authority, their funding, um, mm -hmm. their staff. Uh, that, so that's they're not a, an easy candidate on this. Right. Uh, right. The PUC is quasi judicial, and yes, you can make you know indices and uh, commentaries on your decisions that will give leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, your primary purpose is quasi judicial. That's right. Uh, answering yeah. questions that are put before you. That's right. um, usually, uh, somebody else got, has the idea for the docket, That's usually. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, I guess there's the utility or utilities, and it, by default, they come up with stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's, 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 based, it's based on their interest, of course, <laughs> but they do come up with stuff, and they mm -hmm. want to move ahead, and they're responsive to the goals and targets and all that, so you've got to give them credit for that. Well, let me think, the counties, the counties, as in Maui, Mm -hmm. And MEDB doing stuff, you know, like filling the gap um, and hoping that they're, what they do will somehow, you know, catch fire in other places. But there's no, and the governor is really not, doesn't see himself as a leader of energy. Right. Um, right. Makes comments, but mm -hmm. he's not really taking it forward. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, uh, who else? Did, who did I miss, Marco? What do you think? <laughs> well, I think it's an incredibly juicy and difficult to answer question, Jenny. Uh, I, I think the system in which we live does not lend itself to some type of kind of all-powerful energy czar or czarina, man or woman. <laughs> because, uh, you know, if, if we lived in a more uh, authoritarian dictatorship type of country, that might be possible. But that, of course, is typically not uh, not our nature, uh, not our not our system here. So my response would be is I think. Essentially, we have collective leadership. That we have champions in, uh, from various um, various sectors, including the private sector, which I've been a part of for quite a while, the solar industry. We have champions in the nonprofit sphere. We have folks, you know, from Ulupono Initiative. We have folks from from Blue Planet, Hank Rogers and his group. Uh, if we're lucky, we'll have one or more champions in the legislature. If we're lucky, we'll have a chief executive, uh, Governor Ige, who is, is pushing the ball forward. If we're lucky, we'll have uh, individual actors within Hawaiian Electric and KIUC who are pro-renewable energy, cost-effective renewable energy, electrifying transportation, and so forth. So I think we're, we're destined to continue to, to have a collective leadership and and can only hope that there's enough common ground, enough common goals and strategies that we're moving in the right direction. And uh, mm -hmm. I think, you know, the fact that uh, uh, we've got you there on the commission, Jenny, and uh, our friend uh, Dr. Jay Griffin and now Leo Asuncion, uh, that, uh, you know, I've been in the sphere in, in Hawaii for decades, and, and I'm not even buttering you up for anything when I tell you I've, I've never been so... Uh, hopeful and confident that uh, our current commission and the staff, which I know works their their uh, collective Ocoles off, uh, <laughs> is is we've never we've never had a better commission in, in terms of you guys really get it in my opinion that is the changing regulatory environment, changing utility environment, changing energy environment, and it's critical to have regulators like you three who really do get it. 
So uh, yeah, I, I really do feel it's collective leadership, and I feel pretty good about this collective leadership. That said, if you look at this past legislative session, I don't feel particularly good about what was not uh, accomplished there. So I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking for now. Okay, I'd like rebuttal. May I? Please. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I want to go further on the PUC because the PUC does have the legislative power, the authority mm -hmm. to come up with ideas. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, know, you don't have to treat everything as quasi-judicial you know, right. decision-making. Mm -hmm. You can actually open a docket yourself. Mm -hmm. You can call the parties in. You can bring in a mediator, arbitrator, uh, a master, a special master to decide things. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually talk to people if you want. Right. And right. you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, you know, this leadership there, and you can actually, you can actually do more of that, I think, within your uh, statutory authority. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe you are doing more of that. I, mm -hmm. I sense that you are because mm -hmm. you're, you're fresh and you're, you know, you're, you're innovative. And that's the natural tendency with fresh and innovative people <laughs> yeah. to, to speak up. Right. Uh, so, you know, I, I really think you are a, a, a bigger, better hope than you've ever been. And I, so I, I echo Marco on that. Um, but I also say that um, the way it works, uh, there's room, plenty of room for the PUC to step into more, more of a leadership position on this. But the other thing is I want to disagree with something. May I, Marco? Is it okay? How dare you, but go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> what is this collective leadership? This sounds like an oxymoron to me. <laughs> Either you have a leader or, or a group, but, you know, collective what? And then you wonder about that because this is the land of consensus. And consensus is not our destiny. It's our doom. We, we can't live on consensus. We have to have somebody take a chance, take a risk. And I remember a, a speech that um, uh, David Bissell gave one time uh, in one of our energy programs, and he said, I want you to know that we have a whole concept about taking risk. Uh -huh. We know that risk is built into dealing with new, uh, new technology, new energy technology, yes. and we are uh -huh. willing to appraise the risk, analyze the risk, and take the risk. That's how you move ahead. That's okay. awesome. So, I Absolutely. Mean, and, and, and he does. He does yep. do that. Yes. So anyway, I, I worry with collective, quote, collective leadership that you have the phenomenon of the nail getting hammered down <laughs> or the crab being pulled back in the bucket. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's Marco, you'll have to agree with me. It's second best. Uh, consensus model, collective leadership is second best. You agree? Yes, and uh, I, I don't think it's, it's feasible to, uh, to, to envision some type of uh, one or two individuals who would have the clout, the authority, the ability to, as I mentioned earlier, to be kind of the energy czar, uh, to, to move things in a more bigger, bolder, faster fashion. I, I'm, I'm trying to stay grounded in, in reality, and I'm, I'm trying to spin it somewhat positively, Jay, but I don't disagree with you with your assessment that collective leadership has. Uh, I don't believe that it's oxymoronic, but at the same time, there are inherent uh, weaknesses uh, when you talk about a collective trying to get something, something done in a, in a fast fashion. You are so good, Marco. <laughs> Jenny, what would you add, if anything, to any of that? And so I, you know, I we uh, the the PUC and J, well Jay and I specifically and uh, Caroline Chan and Chris Yunker from the Energy Office were um, asked to join a, a comprehensive electricity planning task force with Nehru Ganasio, which is the National Association of Regulators, and then there's also the State Energy Office. So there was only 16 states that were asked to participate in this effort. And we were put into cohorts, and which means different states were kind of grouped together. And we're in there and we're like, what are we doing with North Carolina? You know, we're kind of like, all right, what are we doing? And I went and I asked that. I said, Danielle, what are we doing with like North Carolina? And she said, all of you have stood up to your utilities. And that's what made you guys a cohort. And I was thinking, so the rest oh, of the PUCs hadn't stood up to their utilities, which doesn't mean that we're like bad utility and we're, you know, but where we're saying, no, we expect you to share in some of the risk or we want to see, we put a contingency on cost recovery here or, you know, I guess there's a lot of rubber stamping out there. But since even that point, I've been asked to speak on so many conferences about regulation, innovation and regulation. 
So, so there is something that's happening here at the PUC. We are innovating, and, and we know that to, to, to a large degree. But I think a lot of where I see, you know, what our responsibilities, and one of the things that, so I, I, I study public, public policy, blah, blah, public policy um, in my master's program. And I worked for not-for-profits. And one thing they told us is the objective of a not-for-profit is to work yourself out of a job. It's your job to, if you are looking for literacy, you know, and that's your whole in initiative, then everybody can read. And then finally you close your doors, you know, hunger is ended and you're, you've done your job as a not-for-profit. In public policy, that's, that's very much the same thing. And as a regulator, if you put on that hat and you think along the same lines, you say, what does it look like if I work myself out of a job? That means that because my job is, is created because we have monopolies. We don't have competitive marketplaces. We have you know, market drivers that get dampened because there's this monopolistic power that kind of keeps things all in, in control. And, the, and the, the role of the regulator is to say, OK, wait, 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 wait. We need some other actors to come in. And, and what we saw happen in, in mid-2015, um, you know, 2013, is we saw this rising up of solar Right, this in that people making decisions, purchasing power, this disruptive technology that not even the commission was in a position to say we were, it was like behind the power curve of like, we need a tariff. We have to be able to control interconnection. Like what's happening? And, you know, and the utility didn't know what to do either. But it wasn't that in its own way was disrupting the monopoly. And it was creating an opportunity in the market for us to evolve as a state. So I think in, as we move forward in our role as in the leadership capacity that we have as the PUC, our job is to enable market competition. Our job is to allow for disruptive technologies to come in and help solve some of these problems and get us to 100% renewable. And so as a regulator and as we look at these dockets moving through our our, you know, our whole procedure, not just performance-based regulation, but even as we look into the stage two renewable um, procurement process, which is in the RFP in front of us right now, how is it that we can uh, accommodate market competition in that competitive bidding process to, to a level that perhaps it, it isn't already a set up to be? And so, so really, we have a leadership role. It's not the only one. But certainly, you can see how, in the past, these types of market transformations have occurred organically. How can the PUC help set, you know, kind of, I guess, the, 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 the I keep thinking of like a garden, right? How can we get the soil ready so that when we plant the make seeds, the and so, yeah, the garden, make the garden grow, right? So <laughs> wow. that's my Wow, Jenny. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm blown away. Marco, you must be blown away, too. He's probably heard that before. I'm speechless. I'm speechless. <laughs> I, I, need, I need a minute to recover. So let's take a break for one minute to come back, and then we can regroup on these and other issues with Jenny Potter. We'll be right back. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Tim Apicella. We are hosts here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks, Thanks so, so much. much. I told you we'd come back, and we did. <laughs> Jennifer Potter, PUC <laughs> Commissioner, and we have Marco Mangelsdorf on the phone. And Marco, I want to offer you the opportunity to react to what Jenny was saying. I know you needed a minute to think about it. <laughs> well, it's, it's really interesting to, to what you shared, Jenny, in terms of uh, grouping these uh, various um, commissions uh, in terms of 
coming up with specific cohorts and and the notion that this particular commission as established with you and Jay and now Leo uh, is being uh, you guys are being noticed for being more challenging of the of the utility company here and the utility company here of course is Hawaiian Electric, Hiko Helco Miko and then KIUC and it, it shows to me that there is a, a more proactive, more uh, exacting uh, set of, of of concerns and desires on the part of the, our current PUC in terms of wanting to see Hawaiian Electric move faster, deeper into the the energy transformation away from fossil-based fuels to cost-effective renewables. And you know, there's a lot that we could discuss in terms of what Hawaiian Electric has been doing, what they haven't been doing well, what they need to do better. And I happen to believe that you know, Dave Bissell, a good friend of mine as well, you know, Dave took KIUC uh, since he became CEO and made it much more aggressive and more risk acceptant. Traditionally, utility companies are risk averse uh, to the extreme sometimes, especially when you have a company like Hawaiian Electric, which has been around for a very, very long time, going back to the days of King Kalakaua in the late 1800s, that Hawaiian Electric companies uh, I think are more, much more towards the risk averse side as opposed to risk ex accepted. There are cultural reasons, there are ingrained bureaucratic reasons and historical traditions of why that company uh, has been difficult to move uh, faster, further, deeper. So I think it's an interesting recognition on the part of national uh, individuals and authorities that this commission is doing something that's laudatory, that's notable, that deserves recognition. Because, uh, you know, and I've been, I, my company used to be part of Hawaiian Electric long ago, so I have both kind of an institutional insider for a time and also an outsider perspective, and I do happen to believe that there are areas of which Hawaiian Electric needs to go faster, further, deeper, and it goes against their grain at times to go faster, further, deeper. So whatever, whatever entities, whatever individuals can push that company harder, I think is to the public benefit. So mm -hmm. I, will, I will leave it at that for now. Well, let me suggest a question that Jenny might ask us. I mean, mm -hmm. in her own yes. way, in her own <laughs> concept of it. So here we are, all things being equal, we're probably going to have, you called it, collective leadership for a while. <laughs> you know, that's not going to change, probably. And, uh, you know, we're going to have you know, all things being equal, except I, I would say the PUC is, is actually dynamic these days. Mm -hmm. um, that's not going to be equal. That's going to be ch changing and, um, you know, taking on more, I think. But if, assuming all things are roughly equal, what needs to happen in this um, collective leadership process, in this landscape of of government and um, industry and academia mm -hmm. um, to move the needle ahead in a way so that we will really reach the goal. Mm -hmm. um, in a general sense, that would be my question, my suggestion of a question you could ask us. I think that's an excellent question. <laughs> would you like to take a crack at that, <laughs> Jay? I'd appreciate it. Well, yeah. I, would, I would start with saying uh, it needs constant attention. It can't be uh, something you put on the shelf. C complacency is not permitted. Mm -hmm. And we know it's connected with climate change there. There can be no rest until we, well, ever, but especially until we deal some way with climate change. Absolutely. You do not see any affirmative steps being taken on climate change. This is very troubling mm -hmm. because it's so closely related to energy. Energy is really part of it. Absolutely. So we have to take affirmative steps. That means we have to think about it all the time. We have to be thinking at every level and every aspect of government, industry, and the public to do stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, organizations like Think Tech should be working to keep it aware, top of mind, Absolutely. for everyone in the landscape. Mm -hmm. And with that, you know, I think we can move ahead. We can never forget. We always have to sort of mm, remind people how important it is That's right. that they have to get involved. You know, it's like this, uh, this, uh, this movie I saw recently called Prosecuting Evil. It's the story of a Nuremberg prosecutor okay. who would meet with his family every evening at dinner 
And when they all came home, they would be at the table together, and he would ask them the same question every day. The question was, what have you done to improve the world today? Every day, to his kids and his family in general. Okay, so the same thing could go here with right. clean energy. Right. Is when, when, you, when they come home and you're sitting at the dinner table, you could ask them, what have you done today mm -hmm. to advance the needle on clean energy today? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that idea. That's great. I mean, for those of us that live and breathe this stuff, and this is where our passion is, that's an excellent question. You know, I, I really, I'm doing the job that I've always dreamed of because I am truly working on an issue that matters to me, and that is climate change. And the work that I do translates to reducing greenhouse gases, weaning us off of fossil fuels, and, and, the, and it's amazing to be able to say that. I I'm, 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 I'm wake up every day and, and give thanks because it's just an incredible feeling to be part of this entity that literally can impact where we're going here. This is so important. You're, you're totally infectious, Jen. Oh, good, good. <laughs> and piggybacking on what you just said, I read a report that was put out by um, the, 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 uh, for the Paris Climate Agreement. It was the international scientists, well, sorry, I'm forgetting the name, but they had a number that said 75 to 80% of all of the electricity generated would need to be moved to renewable sources and the cost by in the next 15 years in order to avert climate, um, the sea level rise that we're talking about and the cost would be $2.4 trillion a year. And that's in 15 years. And you think about what we're doing and the, the, the pace that we're moving at here Peanuts. in Hawaii. It's, it's, it's like we're not moving fast enough, but we can't move any faster. And so it's just, it's like being stuck in molasses because you know the sense of urgency and we feel it, but we're, you know, we're just not able to, to pick up the pace, you know? It's yeah, stuck, stuck in the headlights, but with our eyes closed. Yeah, that's true. It's true. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so, okay, Marco, now you know the subject. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, I'll get to that. Uh, maybe I'll shift from collective leadership to collective action. I mean, there you go. I love it. Good. There we go. <laughs> but, but I mean, there has to be action from the leadership, right? And we have various stakeholders who are trying to move the this, you know, the, the rock of Sisyphus up the hill, you know, so we eventually uh, get to the top of the hill and uh, we're oh. able to, uh, to 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 do what needs to be done to accomplish the things that need to be done. So I don't think that it's going to be some type of revolutionary, dramatic overthrow, overthrow of the current regime, that there's going to be a, a continued incremental changes. I mean, one of the things that, of course, we're keeping an eye on is uh, the public benefits uh, uh, performance, the pure public benefits uh, rate making uh, that is going to fundamentally change, I believe, the nature of Hawaiian Electric, uh, hopefully for the better. You know, we all hope it's going to be for the better. Uh, so there are a number of things in play in terms of the way uh, the structure is, is that we have now is going to be changing on some significant levels. And uh, we, we can't judge progress based on on things changing dramatically overnight but just continuing to move forward hopefully in in, 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 a, in a more accelerated fashion uh, and I, I continue to be hopeful that uh, that is possible that uh, the fundamentally we do want more or less the same thing and that uh, the, the collective action from the collective leadership leads to collective goodwill and and we're collectivizing but not to the point of becoming uh, socialist authoritarian a la China or the Soviet Union but I digress I, 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 I want to take up on uh, Jenny's point about the money, because this, this goes uh, both uh, locally and it goes nationally. Uh, you can't do projects like this without government money, and um, the amount of money you need is enormous, in the trillions. Trillions. And uh, what we're doing now is peanuts, where we're not really doing anything significant. Right. Um, so it's a whole new mindset. We've got to get into a mindset, not only paying attention, Right. Not only working on what collective leadership, collective action, leadership, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> we have to we have to learn to spend some money. We have to That's raise right. the money. We have to spend some money. That's right. And you know, there's there's all this tension in the legislature about oh, we have to raise a little money here, we'll pay a little thing there. It's peanuts. We have to save ourselves. And Absolutely. Clean energy is part of saving ourselves. Exactly. So it is. You get to close, Jenny. I do. Excellent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess I, I think I, I wanna make one thing clear. 
to in this process that we're going through in this transformation with the PUC, with all the stakeholders here in Hawaii, we absolutely have to work together. And that means that the success of HECO is absolutely critical to us getting to our goal. So we need them to remain a viable, healthy utility that serves the people at the lowest cost with the cleanest resources. That means though, that in order to get to where we're going, we are going to have to have a market transformation. Things are going to have to change, in particular if we, need to, we, if we can accelerate. And so working with people, one, one of the things that's so profound is, is pulling the counties in and being able to have their input in, part, in the processes like you know, the performance-based regulation and what does that mean at the local level for each of our islands and how do we, how do we start actually incorporating all of, all of these different stakeholders into a, a process? And it may not be integrated grid planning. It may be performance-based regulation, but we do have some, we have some vessels, we have some you know, mechanisms that can move us forward. It's, and I'm optimistic, but I still, um, you know, just keep working really hard <laughs> because it's not an easy, we're not, we're not out of the woods yet. So, but no. I, I would like to say thank you so much, Jay. And thank you, Marco, for having me again on this and hearing, and it was a pleasure to hear your thoughts on these issues. I wish I would have yielded the microphone a little bit more to get some of the brain oh, dump no. and, you know, absorb some of that brain power. This was your show, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, <if> you, but. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny Potter. Thank you, Marco Mangelsdorf. Great discussion. We have to do it again. Promise me, Marco. So much juicy stuff to talk about, my friends, and so <laughs> little time. So we, we will never get tired of the three of us. At least I, speaking for myself, will never get tired of the three of us getting together. So I really do hope we can make this uh, at least a semi-regular occurrence because uh, we have, uh, if I may be so egotistic, we have important juicy, provocative <laughs> things to talk about that are worth talking about. So thank you so much to, to the two of you, and thank you, Jenny. Thank again you so for much. You'll come back, Jenny, right, the three of us again? Anytime, anytime. All right. You bet. Thank you so <laughs> thank much, you. you guys. Thank Aloha. you. Aloha. <laughs>